It's Kate, and this is the second video for week 11 of Math 23. So let's take a look at the connection between Jacobian matrices and the derivative. So if we have a function that maps from Rn to Rm, it's defined on an open set in Rn, and this is pretty much what it looks like, that it acts on some n component input, and it gives us an m component output, then the Jacobian matrix Jf of x is made up of all the partial derivatives, derivatives of f. Here it is evaluated at a. Note that this is the first derivative of the first component, second, first derivative of the second component, first derivative of the third component, all the way down to the first derivative of the nth component, and then we start taking the derivative with respect to the second input, the third input, the fourth input, the fifth input, so on and so forth. Now we can invent some pathological cases where the Jacobian matrix of f exists because all the partial derivatives exist, but the function itself is not differentiable. And in these particular cases, which we will be talking about in class, using the formula uh, for the directional derivative where we take the Jacobian and we multiply it by v, the direction we're moving in, generally gives the wrong answer for the directional derivative. Basically the problem is that we're trying to use a linear approximation where one does not exist. Basically, using the Jacobian matrix of partial derivatives to get a good affine approximation for a function value at a particular point is the same as assuming that you can reach that particular point by moving along lines that are parallel to the coordinate axes, and that the change in the function along this solid horizontal line right here is pretty much the same as the change in the function along this dotted horizontal line down here. Now with the aid of the mean value theorem, you can actually show that this is the case if the partial derivatives of f at a are continuous, and we will be showing that later. Some interesting applications of derivatives are Newton's method. So Newton's method is based on a tangent line approximation, and it's a way to try to find the zeros of an equation that doesn't happen to be linear. And so we use sort of our best guess that's pretty close to zero, say we find a naught whose function value is close to zero and close to the desired x. And so we use an, our best affine approximation here uh, and what we do here is we find a value for a1 which is where this tangent line itself has a zero. And then we apply the Newton's method or this same approach to say, okay, what is the tangent line approximation at A1? We find that tangent line, we find it's zero, and then we start over again. We say, okay, for that input, what is the tangent line approximation there? Visually, what does this look like? Well, we'll take a look at it in class. I'm sure that Paul will be illustrating it. What's particularly important for us to sort of pick as approximations and then use the tangent line, find the zero of the tangent line, and then use that new input that was the zero for the tangent line as our new best guess for our function and use another tangent line approximation and do this over and over and over again. This is particularly accurate when our first guess is its function value is pretty close to zero. The derivative is pretty large, which means that the zero is quite close by, and the derivative doesn't change too rapidly. So when that when those factors have uh, come to pass, then the point that is actually the zero for the tangent line ends up being a much improved approximation to our desired solution x. And so this actually was uh, some of the material that won the Nobel Prize in economics and some of the details you can find in our textbook Hubbard. Let's take a closer look. Here's what Newton's method looks like in a multivariable case. Say we're trying to solve a system of nonlinear equations in n unknowns. Here they are. And really ordinary algebra is no help. There's really no nonlinear counterpart to row reduction at all. So what we're going to do is take our two functions here and make them the components um, of our function mapping. So we're trying to solve when this particular function has an output that's the zero vector, where this equation is equal to zero and this equation is equal to zero. And suppose we find a point a naught, which is x, y. 
where their function value is actually pretty close to the zero vector. And so what we end up doing there is we take the tangent line approximation at that particular point. One thing to call out is that I'm not entirely sure why there's a tilde on here, but um, let's change this. All those are, are just normal vector arrows. And so what this, this is the tangent line approximation right here. We want to know where the tangent line itself has a zero. So we solve setting this whole thing equal to zero. We find the value a1 that actually accomplishes that. And we can actually solve this because uh, this, if this is invertible, we can just manipulate this around and solve it. And if df happens not to be invertible, then we should probably find a better a naught. But repeating this procedure and then repeating it on a1 and finding the tangent line approximation at a1 and what is the zero of the tangent line approximation at when it's based around a1 and then using that as the next point, your next best guess to where the zero actually is, is pretty much the best known way for solving systems of nonlinear equations. Now if we have a function f that maps from an interval a to b to an interval c to d, we know that if f is strictly increasing or strictly decreasing on a to b, then there's this inverse function g, for which g composed of f and f composed of g are both the identity function. And g goes in the reverse order. g maps from c to d to a to b. And we can actually find this g. We can find g of y for a specific y. Note that g of y will produce x whereas f of x will produce y. That's sort of the relationship that they have there. We can find g of y for a specific y by solving f of x minus y equals 0, maybe even by Newton's method. And if f of x naught equals y naught, and f prime of x naught does not equal 0, we can prove that g is differentiable at y naught, and that g prime of y naught is equal to 1 divided by f prime of x naught. Uh, strictly monotone doesn't generalize, but non-zero f prime of x naught uh, generalizes to invertible. That means that this problem that we had up here where we were talking about whether or not we could actually find the inverse of that particular matrix, we know that by saying non-zero f prime of x naught, then that does mean that that matrix happens to be invertible. But anyway, what we need to do is we can start with a function f, whose partial derivatives are all continuous, so we know that it's differentiable everywhere. We choose a point x0 where the derivative is an invertible matrix. We set y0 to be equal to the result when we have f acting on x0. Then there's this invertible, differentiable local inverse function for points nearby this particular y0. g is f inverse such that g of y0 is equal to x0 f composed of g of y is equal to y. Note that that f should be bold right here. Uh, f composed of g of y is equal to y if y is close enough to y naught. That's, that's what we meant by this works. This is a local inverse function. And dg of y is equal to df of g of y inverse. And that actually follows from the chain rule. We're going to get more into this proof and talk about what is the use of figuring out the derivative of the inverse function anyway, and do a couple of problems with it in class.